Hey, let's start the show. For Thursday, October 15th, 2020, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. I like it. dig that. That yeah, was I think it's a tight 20. Yeah. The tested audience is uniquely talented. Yes. Like, of the of all the audiences on the internet, <laughs> they are uniquely talented and I appreciate them. And what a nice range of musical styles they've been able to create for these intros. That one was created by Gary Walkton. Thank you so much, Gary, for setting that. You, it fit all the criteria. <laughs> you know, that kind of glitchy playback makes me think of the glitchy video ad. Did you see the commercial for the Quest 2 no. TV commercial? No. Well, you weren't watching the NBA Finals. The NBA Finals, which happened this past, past week. Congratulations, LA Lakers. The halftime show was sponsored. The halftime intermission, like the, the conversation, was sponsored by Oculus by Facebook. Oh my gosh. And so they got a 30 second ad spot to play on national audience on ABC. And you can Google this, but uh, it was uploaded probably a week ago, but it's on YouTube, their ad. And their whole ad campaign for the Quest 2, TV ad campaign, and I guess web ad if you want to have it on YouTube, is this kind of glitchy editing style where you're watching archaic input methods such as the mouse, game pads, joysticks. Super archaic buttons, getting mm-hmm. rid of buttons. Yeah. And it finished pays off with after the glitchiness of the video of smooth video of a kid putting on the Oculus Quest 2 with some tagline that isn't memorable enough for me to remember what it is right now. So all gaming before the virtual reality was all archaic input. and glitchy? All input. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's not a great ad, I think. That doesn't really show you what the Quest can do or what virtual reality is. It assumes you know what VR is. It really it touts though two ninety nine. Anyway, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, a little bit more later on in the episode. We've got just Jeremy and me today, a dual cast, recording a little bit early, special episode, you might call it, uh, because we're recording this just hours after the Apple iPhone keynote event. Indeed, indeed. And I will be getting my first iPhone in three years. So I tuned in and I wanted to know what I'd be getting. You watched uh, the 70-minute infomercial on on your laptop, on your TV, on your big new TV? Did you pipe it up? We've been doing this since 2007. We we know that 70 minutes is on the short side. Like it could have been so much worse. So true, uh-huh. so true. And at least 10 of those minutes were, were, uh, were the, the, the speaker, the AirPod, or sorry, the HomePod Mini, 100 right. bucks. So, okay, so many of those details, we're gonna, it's undoubtedly going to be our top story this week. Apologize if you're not into the Apple News. But before we get into that, a little bit of catch up. I'm back in San Francisco. I uh, was traveling last week. Um, Joey tested negative for COVID. Feel pretty good about that. Uh, and um, it's been quite a whirlwind week, but it's good to be back home. I just, you know, I, I was looking at um, how strange this year has been, and I was flipping through, you know, as the phone occasionally shows you, memories from the past, from your photo album. A year ago, in late August, I had there was a one week span where we were doing Silicon Valley Comic Con in late August, Silicon Valley Comic Con for three days after which I jumped on an airplane to go to a movie set, which I won't name, for three days. Then I flew back and went to Disneyland with my family and Avery for the first time to do a small girl's run for two days. And D23 was going on, the, uh, the convention. And this then, is when you famously told your family to go without you, that you would see them on the other side. I would see them on the other side. No, no, no. That was Walt Disney. That was Walt Disney World. That was that was this year. No, this is Smuggler's Run. No, no one's abandoned for Smuggler's Run. Oh, that was okay. fine. 
Yeah. And then flew back and went to like a, a toddler's birthday party. Like all that happened in eight days. And that kind of busyness just doesn't happen this year. Yeah. I miss it a little bit. Yeah. Uh, well, the kind of activity we have around here is, uh, you know, the most excitement that we have is a film marathon because uh, my kids are on a week long break from school and my 13 year old got in his head that he wanted to see the dark night. And so Ooh. I said, I said, you know, okay, but you know, I don't want you to think that's Batman. So let's, I'll watch the dark night with you, but we have to watch all the Batman leading up to it. So Sat Sunday night, we watched the 1966 Batman, the movie. <laughs> the movie with all the villains, with the, the, the shark and the giant bomb. All right. You've seen it? Of course. It's, it was for the while, but it was the only Batman, uh, Adam West Batman you could get on yeah. a streaming service because the TV show wasn't streaming. It's fantastic. I mean, it's talk about it like campy. It's out there. But it's also in, in some regards like the most comic bookish. I mean, it's really, really silly. On a Pia's. We loved it. I mean, it's filled with Dutch angles. Like half the movie must be Dutch angles. And then that was echoed for, in last night's 1989. Whoa, 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 whoa. We skipped the animated cinematography. One. Yes. So you, because the, the 1966 Batman series mm -hmm. is shot on film, first of all. It's in that golden era of television shot on a film, four by three asterisk ratio. It was one of the reasons why buying those on Blu-ray now, the, the, the conversions are so pristine. It likes Star Trek in the same era. The lighting and attention to detail in, those, in, in the cinematography, they're, they stand the test of time. They're like pulp pages come to life with the, the flashy mid-century you know, on-screen graphics, uh, the, 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 the color lighting they put on all the actors. Right. It's, it's gorgeous just to look at, even if you're not a comic book fan. I'm with you on that. And I think that, that something about a color being a relatively new film technology, I think was they were still toying with that in the same way that the Beatles were toying with stereo, you know, that they, they pushed it. And I, I loved it. I, I thought it was hilarious, you know, and certainly didn't take itself too seriously, which is a good thing. It's something that, you know, Marvel got right out of the gate. And it turns out Batman did too. <laughs> they, they just forgot about it in the 80s. So we're, we're, we're going to go into Batman Forever tonight, which I don't remember at all. But it's like it's a, it's a very highly rated movie. Wait, wait, wait. You say you skipped the 1989 Tim Burton Batman. No, we watched that last night. Okay. And then Batman Returns as well? Uh, I'm sorry. Is that the second one? The second one with Catwoman is Batman Returns. That's, that's tonight. Okay. Yeah. Great. That one is highly regarded. Batman that's, Forever is not so much. I got them mixed up. Batman Returns is the one I was thinking of. Okay. And that's rated even higher than the 1989. So I'm in for a treat. I can't wait to see what, what it is. I completely forgot all of the ones after the first 1989. No so idea. So you're going to go through Batman Forever, Batman and Robin, the Joel Schumacher era. Yeah, like 11 percent back. Tomatoes. I mean, it, it's not just the Ron Santa score. It's the context of like that set back superhero film for so long when you had this golden era of the Chris Reeve Superman films, the Tim Burton Batman films, like it was a, it was, it was like an economic downturn, <laughs> right? It was a recession in quality. The great comic book movie recession. Yeah. All leading to Christopher Nolan, which the great Phoenix rising um, with, uh, you know, Batman, the new, the, the, what Ends. is it? The begins, begins followed by the dark knight which in my mind is the best and then you have you know bane as the third one yeah uh, so your, your kid has never seen dark knight he just wants to you're gonna no. make him earn it but oh, he has no he's not seen it but okay. he's seen he's seen inception which is what led us there because he's a he's massive fan of of the movie oh he, i think he's gonna dig it yeah i'll be available and answer any questions he may have if you want to do a, maybe we should get him on the podcast and do a two hour, two hour dissection of, he needs to understand the context. If you're trying to establish context for him, you know, yeah, to, to, for the buildup, I'm happy to oblige. Uh, but looking forward to uh, hearing what your kid thinks about that and what your, your own journey is about that. Yep. Uh, in my household, uh, coming back from my big trip, one of the big things I had waiting for me is actually set up right behind me. Oh, other ways better. I have um, a new 3D printer. I'm testing right now. It's uh, the Anycubic Mono X. 
and uh, we've done a bunch of 3D printer testing in the past, but this is with my first SLA printer I have set up at home. Previously, it was all at the tested office. That's exciting. Um, it's, you know, along with the Elegoo, the, the Saturn, these are this kind of relatively inexpensive SLA printers these days. Uh, basically, it's, right, you think, you think of SLA curing, they're all in, in that price point, LCD screens, you get them at 1080, some of them are even 720. This is a 4K um, mono, so it's just black and white. You don't need color, and so apparently it's better contrast. You get uh, it's faster prints. Basically, it's just Z-axis, right? You have a, a vat with your FEP film. Uh, you have you pour your, you literally just hand pour your resin in. A build plate plops in, flashes the LCD with uh, UV light, and then raises it. Uh, incrementally on that z-axis and you have giant 3d print i mean that's where sla technology is today no fancy mechanical movement of tilting of the uh, the uh the reservoir or anything that, that the form stuff does um a lot of troubleshooting for these type of class of printers but uh, i'm looking forward to doing some pretty big and fast relatively fast prints with this one uh, given how cheap displays are these days i'm surprised that they have any kind of tiering system as far as the resolution goes um, um, I, I think, think 4K would be across the board. There's probably some diminishing returns, also power. Like there's a like a whole thing with you know how big your build plate needs to be, how big you want your reservoir to be, how much you want to pour, right? How much actual resin you want to pour into it, um, and and um, yeah, it's all fundamentally the same technology. The LCD probably it's, it's a consumable, so it's something that you know you. Uh, you will have to replace and it's really an expensive part. But the differences, subtle differences are going to be in like the slicing software between companies and also how readily available those consumable parts are. The FUP film to, to stretch across the bottom of your reservoir uh, and how reliable that Z-axis is, how easy your leveling process is. Uh, but you can get one of these for like 700 bucks. Wow. Yeah, pretty big. Um, so looking forward to testing that. Uh, and well... I think we should get right to it, right? Let's. I uh, do too. Let's, okay, so it's going to be. We're. Not, I'm probably not going to have a big technology news segment, but instead, uh oh, let me let me make sure I get my my stuff queued up. It's going to be our top story. Top story this week. So, Jeremy, it's settled a debate for me. Is the iPhone 12 a return to the iPhone 4 form factor or the iPhone 5 form factor? <laughs> um, you know, I'm going to say the 5 because... Ooh, I agree. Uh, I don't know. I mean, the 5 was a revolution of the 4. And in my mind, the best. I, I know a lot of people like the 4 and the 4S. I, just, I loved the 5. Um, I think we had a bigger screen that year. Uh, in any case... One. It, it, it doesn't matter. It's it's very similar to either one of those, um, and you, which means you have the flat sides. Uh, the curve yes, is yes. gone. Champers return. That's right. Um, now I don't know how much that will matter based on you know your whether or not you put it in a case. I mean, one of the big deals of this year is uh, once again they've improved improved the quality of the glass. <laughs> which like how many times can they do that? And every single time, it, it doesn't seem to make any difference to me because I, I shatter my phone um, if I drop it once or twice. And so I, I don't, I'm tempted to give it a shot. You know, they want me so badly not to use a case. They, they've always wanted that. But uh, I don't know. Are, what about you? Are, are you planning to upgrade this year? I'm on an upgrade plan. So it's not even a decision I have to make. I'm on, I'm on the, the rental plan, the just spend that $60 a month and get continual upgrades. And that was probably one of the smarter decisions I made because I like not having to make the decision. Like the decision always seems to be year over year, is it an incremental upgrade or is this a tick or a talk? And mm -hmm. especially when we have with the iPhone 10, uh, that design has lasted for three years now, right? The 10, mm -hmm. 10S, 11, 11, 11. And uh, yeah, there's no, I guess we didn't have, didn't have an 11S. They went, skipped over 11S. They went straight to 12. So three years, which is new for, it was for, for Apple. But let's lay it all out there in case you uh, did not follow their big announcement. It was a phone event. They had a HomePod mini. Uh, I will say from a production standpoint, 
they've really nailed the look of a virtual keynote in terms of let's not even try to pretend it's a stage. Let's just bring in some fancy cinematography and drone cams and basically edit together a commercial. And I they, felt like they they upped it even more this this one. You didn't yeah. feel that way? Like no, I no, felt no like- that's what I'm saying. They they they've gone to a point where they don't even have to follow the conventions of a keynote. It's right. now just a promotional video where they have computer controlled cameras yeah. and highly edited. They don't have to feign the 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 kind of we're all on a stage, you know, talking with a a big screen behind you. Hey, right? if that gets me to a seventy minute program, I'm all for it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, they did have a guest though. The one I was most impressed by was that shot in early on of I think it went from Tim Cook or somebody, one of the VPs, and then it zoomed down to a miniature oh ha- home, and there was a man in there, <laughs> and he had he had a, like a home pod, and he wa- we walked around his house, yes. and it was completely yes. seamless. Completely. I mean, it was I mean, <laughs> for a keynote video, that that's beyond what I've come to expect from them. It was just Apple flexing their muscles and said, we have all the money. Yeah. We have all the money. We can do any kind of camera move, any virtual camera move. We can CG, composite in. A, we, let's build a miniature house. Let's build a miniature little ta- uh, stage that they could then do some tricky camera inception moves and, and change scales. I mean, moving I, to the quantum realm. I think most people just take take that for granted. But as people who play with video, who work with video, that's the kind of thing that I, I was definitely impressed by. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's talk about the products, though. So uh, HomePod Mini, HomePod not being a very successful Apple line. I think well, they did a smart thing in lowering the price. 100 bucks. you're paying for the Apple tax. Yeah. Uh, and it'll probably sound good. And it gets you Siri, and they are selling privacy as their big message yet again. I'll bet it sounds better than the the hundred dollar Echo, um, and so and if they're, I bet it does. I mean, th- their whole pitch was, you know, high quality drivers, um, engineered for sound. What are they calling it? computational sound? They're applying the same philosophy of, that they're applying to, to photography to yeah. audio, um, and you know, it it looks cool if you bring your phone close to it, it automatically starts playing. I hope that that doesn't happen when you don't want it to, um, but it, you know, I'm. I unfortunately they are so they were so far behind Amazon in this space that they have a lot of they have to be better than Echo, and um, I I don't know if sound quality is going to be all that's required of them. I think sound quality for their target audience is, and it is a strange product line for them because when you think of all the other competitors competing this in the smart speaker space, uh, Amazon dominantly, they're there not just to sell you speaker Bluetooth speakers. Amazon is in that space to cl- collect your information. And if Apple is explicitly not in this home speaker space to collect information, making that a selling point, then they are doing what they are traditionally doing, which is to make money on hardware. And it doesn't feel like they're. It feels like they have. They feel like they have to be in the space to not let an Amazon dominate. So it's a very defensive move. It's a product line that feels very defensive rather than the confidence they typically have, uh, because they didn't. They don't have the confidence in HomePod. Two hundred fifty dollars, three hundred bucks, did not sell well. For they want a discount all the time. And so it's more like, let's give you a really nice quality speaker, give you a service that maybe will improve Siri over time for us as they, you know, use that as their, you know, big AI service. And then uh, also be in the room so you don't buy the Amazon product. I don't know. Don't buy the Google product. I just mean in terms of what this what the device can do. Uh, Amazon is so far ahead of them. I mean, not look. Just the fact that you can buy things from Amazon is like a big one-up that Amazon has against them. Right. But then they have this entire children's layer on Echo now, which, you know, is like it recognizes everyone's voice independently and it will provide unique responses to children and provide them with unique activities. And I think they have a service that like you can pay to get the premium tier of that. Um, and, you know, it's just they're in my mind, they're really far beyond them in terms of the services that they offer. It would take a lot for us to, to transition over, but I if it does sound better, I'd you know, you know, more power to them. That that's the one thing that I that I wish Echo would take more seriously. You have to buy their premium model in order to get anything close to high quality sound. I mean, Apple 
<laughs> children don't have deep wallets. Their customers, their target customers are the parents or the young adults that are moving into spaces. And it is the Apple tax of having this premium design product in the home. And I still think it is, yeah, it is spending a hundred bucks on that. We'll have to see what the sound quality is compared to the hundred dollar version on Amazon side or Google side. Yeah. Um, but it's to take the place. So you don't buy the competitors products. You stay within the ecosystem, which you know, improves the quality of usage if you also have their phones as well or their watches as well. Uh, Okay, and then the other phones, the big part of the event, phones. We have more new phones from them than ever. Uh, (laughs) Isn't it? Is that crazy? They skipped 11S. Yeah. And they and they went to four different 12s. Yeah, and and the twelve is different than the eleven, like substantially, even for where it it stands in its in the in the uh, the hierarchy, right? That, like that's the, what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Like the the past two year, did they do it with the ten S as well? I forget. Yeah, the, was it was just the, it, the it was iPhone like, the 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 iPhone eleven, the standard eleven. Well, first of all, the iPhone ten became right. what would be the 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 eleven Pro. And now both the 12 and the 12 Pro are essentially the same like m- like main phone. You yeah. finally have OLED and super high definition across the entire line. Right, right. It was a whole. It was a shift to justify the thousand dollar standard. Right when the 10 launched, it was a big jump. For some context, thousand dollar phone. Would people buy it? Yes, they would. Uh, but they found a way to meet people in the middle by launching the 11 as the LCD, the same form factor, but you really kind of like the, the the entry level phone, the mid-range phone, so to speak. And then they called their $1,000 standard the Pro model. And right. here, it feels like that's been reset yet again, where it feels like the standard 12 is not that much more of a compromise in terms of day-to-day functionality. And- no, I totally agree. And it's, it, I feel like the more exciting upgrades are to the base phone yeah. and, and it's, like if i were in the market for a smaller phone this new tiny 12 the mini I, the mini i think is super cool like that's a wonderful form factor i you know, a lot of, a lot of me a lot of a part of me misses those earlier smaller phones just from a portability standpoint and the way that they so easily you know fit in a pocket um i with my 46 year old eyes i can't handle that anymore but if i were younger uh, and if I had, you know, if I, that was style or whatever was a priority for me, uh, I would certainly be looking at that 12 mini and not to mention the fact that I think it's a, it's cheaper too. It, it that that's one thing that surprised me because there are a lot of people clamoring for the mini. I think so many of the, the tech enthusiasts will be debating between how much they love that form factor of the, the nostalgic iPhone five form factor of the 12 mini at 5.4 inches screen edge to edge, uh, versus whether they want to spend a thousand dollars or more on a pro, which has the extra camera has the lighter, those being the, the big fundamental differences and the, the finish of course. So iPhone 12, has now the iPhone 5 like form factor, aluminum back, you know, edge head screen, OLED across the board, 5G being a big a thing also across every one of their phones. I was a little surprised by that. I thought that was going to only make it to the Pro, but it sounds like they, they managed to, if they're going to build that engine and have the modem in there, uh, all their phones have 5G, it uses the A14 chip, which is going to be the first processor on the market with a five nanometer process. That is big deal that is leaps and bounds and this is going to be the fundamentally the chip not only that uh on the new ipad as well ipad pros as well but also presumably a version of this on the um the dedicated uh macbooks what can you tell me about 5g right now norman uh is that is that something that is completely rolled out across the country at least in america it is it supported by all the carriers equally and um you know, what does it mean in terms of my actual usage? I mean, mo- a lot of people on LTE, if you get all your bars, yep. they're not complaining a whole lot as it is. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think wh- 5G is a solution and problem of a, a need of a problem right now, especially working from home. Uh, the whole, you know, you can hear them when they when they make the arguments that 5G will make you less reliant on Wi-Fi and so your data will be more secure. That's a stretch of an argument. I don't think the vast majority of people feel unsecure when they're on Wi-Fi 
deployment is an absolute issue. Uh, Verizon being their big partner has 5G sporadically launched across the U.S. And 5G is there's just like in the old days with 4G and 4G being uh, LTE versus HSPA plus. There's a difference between the fastest version of 5G and the most base level of 5G. The millimeter wave 5G, the one that's going to require more line of sight, uh, that is not widely deployed and definitely not for use in the homes. That's more for when you're in a, 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 a arena environment or a stadium environment where there's going to be a lot of open airspace and they can have the radios broadcast to you with more line of sight. But of course, we're not going to those arenas. We're not going to the stadium. So really is a technology that's that was not that 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 really is uh, in this kind of limbo phase because of COVID, because of people working from homes and the lockdown, and also because um, we just don't have uh, kind of ubiquity uh, for that as much as we do LTE. I mean, it's going to be like a a built-in sleeper functionality, and the trick is going to be if you upgrade to these phones, how you can get away with not paying for a five G subscription. And I don't know what Verizon or what other carriers are going to do with their their kind of upgrade plans. A lot of people still get their phones on subsidized upgrade plans if they're going to be able to get subsidized upgrades without having to opt into a 5G service plan. So 5G plans are not going to be the, the new default? You just all you know service providers roll their customers into them automatically? I, don't, I, I hope not. I really hope not. I don't want to pay I, unless I – don't, I don't think they would be able to do that without raising the price. Wow. Okay. Well, I guess something to yeah. keep our eyes on. I, I know that the, the new iPhone will automatically switch you back to LTE if you don't need 5G. Yeah, sure. And that tells me this is more of them uh, just hedging on the fact that people will probably pick this up and not be using 5G. And 5G is going to be for the limited number of people who can take advantage of that. The fact that they're making that a big selling point of this phone is unexciting to me. It's a future-proofing thing it's for people who buy phones you know who aren't on a phone upgrade plan who buy buy phones like once every three years mm-hmm. in three years maybe you'll want 5g and so maybe that's more them convincing you this is a big and that they've reset the the kind of cycle and the 12 not only is it new form factor has all this you know new computational power but it has you know antennas and it's future proofing um which is good so uh new screens thinner form factor the other big thing magsafe is back I thought this was a, a massive part of the phone. Um, uh, there's magnets as well as inductive charging, which the current phones have, but because you have an aluminum back, uh, accessories, including uh, a big iPhone charger up to 15 watts, they said. Uh, don't know what that means in terms of how long it will take to charge a phone, but um, you have new cases that have power pass-through. You have all sorts of things that you can attach to the back. And I think the third party accessory market it's going to really love this idea of being able to have things attached to the back strong strong magnets in the back of your phone totally uh that um that form of charging requires you to be in alignment in order to get the most out of the charge so you can place your phone or whatever you have onto a charging pad and it it might charge really you know fast it might charge slightly less based on where it, it is aligned it's not like a binary thing. So the fact that the, those magnets are on there, it's a good thing to begin with just for alignment. Did you see um, the magnet arrangement and missed opportunity there? The magnet I, I, arrangement is sort of a circular. circle yeah. plus a straight line in the bottom. That's how you're going to get the alignment. Yeah. So there's like a, a, a vertical bar plus a circle. What a missed opportunity to do a power icon. Oh, I, I thought it looked like a power icon already. No, so I, I was... Yeah, you, you, they got That's you. Fine. Yeah, they, they, they cover their base. It's fine. Yeah. Um, the Verge pointed out that um, that you can't get the 15 watt charging unless you use a mag uh, safe charger. Uh, Their official re- one, like a third yeah, part, you, certified. Oh. Or anything that's going to be, yeah, going to be certified by Apple. Um, yeah. So there are 15 watt chargers out there that apparently won't work um, out of the box. So that's um, a new way for Apple to, you know, tax their their partners. Speaking of out of the box, uh, this will be the first iPhone that won't include a wall wart. It'll have yeah. a charging cable, lightning, still with lightning, lightning to USB-C. That's great. Um, I was surprised that they didn't just move to USB-C finally. Um, they, they have on, I think, the iPad Pro. Um, so let's, let's just bring it, bring it to the iPhone. Why not? Um, but, you know, I'm all for removing the wall wart 
even the earbuds, which I never used. It would be nice if they, you know, if the, I, got, I saved a little money by them taking those things away. No, that's no, 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 of course not. <laughs> Net zero. It's all not about their way. Yeah. Uh, and then, so the 12 and the 12 mini, essentially the same hundred dollar price difference. I don't know. I mean, unless you want a bigger screen, if the battery life is comparable or the same, the 12 mini seems to be the way to go. It's hundred dollars cheaper. Well, yeah, I think it's a cool phone too. And, and uh, the, the smaller form factor is something that people have been asking for a long time. They are launching on different dates, though. So the 12 is uh, on pre-order at the end of this week and shipping next week. And the 12 mini, uh, along with the Pro Max, is going to be November 6th. So staggered launches. I think that's really interesting as well. For me, personally, I want to upgrade my camera. So I already knew I was going to be going for the Pro. Um, yes. now you, you have an 11 Pro, so you... You know, if if I were in your shoes and I didn't have the upgrade plan, I'm not sure that I would um, have the incentive to upgrade to this year's model. But coming from the 10, I'm I'm very excited. And they did add lidar, which on you know another uh, point is like super exciting from an AR standpoint, and uh, just to be in that space and and be able to scan things, rooms, objects. That's going to be fun to toy with. Yeah, the three cameras on the Pro, you have the standard wide angle. Then you have uh, the uh, that's twenty six millimeter equivalent. Then the thirteen millimeter uh, ultra wide, which doesn't look like that's going to be improved. I'm really curious if they change the sensor at least on the ultra wide, so you can at least change focus. The current ultra wide camera, I think it's great for video, but one of the problems I have is that it's a fixed focus. So anything too close to the camera, which typically you can get with an ultra wide, is out of focus. Uh, and then the the uh, telephoto. Uh, which is a typically a 2x on the past phones uh, is now different between the pro and the pro max yeah on the pro it's a doubling of the wide angle so it's 52 millimeter equivalent from 26 and then on the pro max it actually is a 2.5x um uh, uh focal length as the um uh, or you can think of a zoom uh, as the wide angle. So it actually will have a, a, a measurable difference in terms of the kind of bokeh you can get. Uh, but the lidar, I think, is a uh, is hugely important. This is the this is the um, the NAND memory of uh, that the iPod Nano had that helped the iPhone work. This is what's going to be kind of helping them collect data, optimize their neural engines, and scale manufacturing for their AR glasses. We all expect to have at least one of these IR um, time of flight uh, scanners. Um, and it's a natural evolution from what they did with Face ID. So this allows for basically depth mapping of the world in daylight, in darkness, so you can get low light portrait mode, much better portrait mode. Computational photography is a big thing they're talking about. And perhaps the best feature for me, the reason I'm more, most excited to upgrade is that they're gonna also, with this new processor, A14, allow for a new raw photo editing mode on these phones. Right, you're a big raw guy. Now, now tell me, what do you think most people are gonna be interested in this? What, what, is, what is shooting in this format gonna get you? So. Typically, traditionally, before the 12, the raw, people who like shooting in raw were conflicted, especially if you're on an iPhone, because Apple's natural, like they put all this computational energy in, in their image stack to give you a great looking picture, not just a good looking picture, a great looking picture out of the box, right? So you don't have to think about it. You get some nice dynamic range, you get some, you know, you get some good portrait mode stuff, uh, but you're locked into basically a flattened image. Uh, even with the, the portrait mode, like depth adjustments that you could do, like you're basically, like the photo that the phone takes is the photo that you have to share. And any type of filter that you add on top is a modification of that compressed photo. A raw picture is basically an uncompressed photo. It's more true to the original uh, bits that the the sensor is taking in and allows you some uh, more adjustability, uh, specifically in the, uh, the, the lighting and, and bringing out details and changing some of the exposure uh, of your photo, as well as the color. So one of the best things about shooting in raw is that you can change to whatever co color temperature. If the 
auto exposure setting and the auto color light detection settings of the your camera, whatever you're using, mismatches light, especially if you're taking a photo indoors with a raw photo. You can make it warmer, make it cooler, change the tint of it. Uh, that type of flexibility you wouldn't get with a JPEG or not as much with a JPEG. But photographers have to choose between shooting raw, which gives you that type of post-processing ability, or shooting with Apple's camera app, which gives you all their computational photography, all that stuff. You couldn't do both. This, what it sounds like what they've allowed is with their version of RAW is that ability to do both. Is not only with their first party application in the camera app, allow you to take a photo, go in adjustments, and you have adjustments right now in the camera app and do a lot more granular tweaking with color temperature, with exposure, things that you can do to some extent right now. And I think a lot of people just have come to you know, expect that. But also, it sounds like an API for third-party applications, like from Adobe, to allow you to import photos taken from your phone in this new Apple Pro Raw uh, format and adjust in something like Lightroom or Photoshop. So and raw, not just limited to the camera app. Raw photos are obviously uh, uncompressed as well, unlike JPEGs. So you're, gonna, you're not going to have to suffer from any amount of artifacts and probably a lot easier to zoom in on things and get as crisp an image as, as possible. I wonder how much bigger these files are going to be. It's usually an order of magnitude bigger. You know, you can have, you know, on, on a DSLR shooting on RAW, you can have about 50 megabyte images. My feeling, my suspicions are that Apple's RAW format will have some level of compression that <laughs> they're going to optimize, especially if you're storing to iCloud, they're going to optimize some part of the process and still give you flexibility in terms of adjusting things you wouldn't be able to do, but it's not going to be as uncompressed as pure a file as you would have taken with a, a raw photo on uh, your DSLR. The, um, the Pro Max has, uh, you mentioned a couple of the features. It also has a one more X optical zoom. So it can go to five X optical, which is cool. Uh, it also does, um, instead of having the lens move for optical image stabilization, they're actually moving the sensor yeah. around. They're saying that that can move it like 5,000 movements a second. I, th yeah, that's something that um, we'll see a lot. It's a mechanical thing, right? So that's uh, yeah. you have to get that working. Uh, a lot of the mirrorless cameras we've seen in the past five years have uh, combined optical image stabilization with sensors being able not only to move laterally, but also tilt um, for that kind of camera shake. And I don't know the complexity of getting that to manufacture easily on a small sensor, small form factor, but anything that gets you better stabilization, I think is gonna make video look amazing. The video stuff, the Dolby 10-bit 4K, 60 FPS video editing, uh, that stuff looks so good. I'm really excited about that. Yeah, you're talking about being able to shoot in Dolby Digital, HDR. Dolby Vision. Dolby Vision, HDR, 10-bit video. They're talking about like 60 times the number of colors in standard def video. I mean. That, again, what are the file sizes going to be on that, and and how easily are they going to be shared, um, and and you know how many screens can even display that kind of definition, and yeah. what are they going to look like if you upload them to YouTube? To everything gets compressed. <laughs> I don't. I think everything is going to get flattened when you upload to yeah. YouTube, or if you air airplay it. Honestly, uh, anyone who they has did seen say how... you could airplay the Dolby Vision to oh, an could. Apple TV. Yeah. Okay. I mean, what about the Apple TV app on HDR TVs? Right, don't know. Don't know. Uh, anyone who's you know seen how great a video can look on your phone and the difference between that and what happens and how kind of crunchy it looks when you airplay it to your TV uh, will be very happy about this because you know, a lot of people have 4K TVs and a lot of people have HDR TVs. And they, they shouted out Dolby Vision, they shouted out HDR10 uh, and, and like a third HDR spec. Um, so this is all about, again, making the content that you produce with these phones have more life beyond the phones themselves, which that's the thing they can't control normally. Mm -hmm. uh, capacity is increased, finally. So prices are staying the same, $1,000 for the Pro it's at the base model, and it's going to be 128 gigs. This might be an interesting decision for folks, right? Because previously, we knew 64 gig was not enough for the Pro phone, and 256 was very generous and well worth the upgrade. But is 128 enough? And will that be sufficient for most people? Well, 
it, who knows about most people, but I think certainly there's going to be a market for it. I mean, if there was a market for 64, there's certainly going to be a market for 128. And uh, especially with everything being cloud-based, Apple would love you to be on the 128 because that just means you're going to be hitting, you know, that the local iCloud. the local limit pretty quickly and pushing everything up in iCloud and storing everything there. I, I, I still think, you know, their iCloud play, I said this before, is the a byproduct of them having 10 years, 13 years now of people on the same phone ecosystem and not being able to get the media off of their phones. You know, you don't, most people are not buying their iPhones for the first time right now. You and I certainly aren't. And we are not buying phones to start fresh at zero. You know, we don't buy phones to just to have 200 gigs free. We buy phones to import all of the media to migrate everything from our existing phones, which were previously migrated from the phones before that. And so I have the existing media baggage of, of 10 years of iPhones. And that's why 128 just wouldn't do it for me. I that's in, to go back. interesting. Yeah, especially if you connect that to these new image formats, whether it's RAW or HDR video that are going to be taking up more space, it's going to mean you hit those limits and you're going to be pushing up to the next tier by the next time you come around to buy a new iPhone. Yeah. Uh, other differences that we want to mention between the, the, the Pro Max is 6.7 inch screen. So it's even bigger than that 6.5. Uh, the resolution stuff is crazy confusing. I'm not even going to try. I've gone past that phase of my life where I can memorize resolution pixel uh, dimensions um, for these phones. The, even, even, the, even the PPI. Yeah. Between the eleven, uh, between the 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 phones, the pixels per inch are different to a point where there's going to be scaling. Remember what a controversy it was when there was scaling on MacBooks and on phones that when they went rendering at a at an integer multiplier. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be yeah. the case for like, at least the mini. Uh, and developers have already gone in and said, okay, the mini is actually doing some downsampling. They're rendering at the the pixels per inch of, or uh, one, you know, one of these, they're, they're not rendering at a at a um, at the uh, the exact pixel resolution. And really, they're, they're going to be some. If you if you if you look really close, there'll be some kind of dithering artifacts or some type of you know smoothing artifacts. Yeah, that's my that's the point though, is that you have to look really close. I th- yeah. I think for most people, this kind of you know compromise is going to be completely unnoticeable let alone worth it. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be fine. Once you get to this resolution, the artifacting that you see from any kind of bad scaling, especially if it's done, you know, with taste is going to be minimal, minimal. Uh, I would, I would point out that the, uh, the LIDAR is also used for autofocus in low Mm. light. Yes. So that's fantastic. I I mean, that's one of the things I'm most looking forward to having a, a, a 10 is I haven't had any kind of night mode you know, capabilities. So the fact that this will now only, this will be able to focus as if it's in broad daylight in low light, that's fantastic. So much of this is the benefit of them moving to this new chip, the A14 and five nanometers, because I'm sure their target is for same battery life, but then they can have lower capacity battery, which means that everything can be smaller. And this is the first phone in a while where if you go from the uh, the pro models to the pro models, it will be slightly smaller, slightly lighter, there as opposed to slightly heavier, slightly thicker. Um, and and so it does feel like a a big milestone in terms of design there. I mean, you look at their breakdown of that chip and it's crazy. A quarter of that chip is their neural engine. Like how mm. much of just, uh, this is something that matters in terms of those number of transistors. Like the, it's the area, the the square millimeters of that that processor is devoted to, you know, uh, computation, uh, computational like learning, um, deep learning. What color are you going for? Pacific blue. Yeah, is that what it's too. called? Yeah, I'm going for blue. The, yeah, new blue. I don't. I, I, I'll, I'll probably. I mean, I'm, I'm on the pro because I'm on the upgrade plan, but uh, I like the matte look. <laughs> the standards. <laughs> oh, me I think too. The, the glossy is a little too gaudy for me. I, I'm uh, one of the things I liked about the five was the matte look, and if they're going aluminum, I wish they'd gone for that. Kishore but, said in Slack, "If you're gonna spend a thousand dollars on a phone, go full glossy." Ah, I suppose, I suppose. <laughs> uh, and then um, I think that's it for the, the specs. Um, it, it's gonna, they're going to sell a ton of these. 
I, I know I asked this last week, is there going to be appetite? And just judging from the social media reaction, judging from the, the, the range of pricing going from $699 all the way to $11 as the base model for the Pro Max, um, they're going to they're gonna sell a lot. Yeah. Think, um, I didn't see any mention of Wi-Fi 6. I'm still curious about that. Um, I'm sure if that is just an assumption that Apple's making, like, okay, of course that's going to be in there. Great. I'd like to see it uh, listed somewhere. And I was sad to see not, um, that they decided to uh, forego 120 hertz screens. But I assume yeah. That, yeah, that that's just something that they're holding off for the, uh, for the off year. I think it's a battery consumption thing. I think sure. that's, that's, they want to keep this battery life. Uh, I will say that scrolling... You know, the processing. I'm not nearing, not noticing any lag, but I have uh, been noticing that the the lack of smoothness on the phone scrolling compared to using some of the Android phones I've had used lately. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's it for the Apple event. There you have it. There's probably be one more event by the end of this year for Apple for their new MacBooks, this is their new ARM-based MacBooks, and that's a big unknown in terms of performance. So um, and, and and app compatibility. Uh, so it'll be more exciting uh, for that. Um, before we move on to our next segment, though, I want to let you know that this week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible with support from Storyblocks. Now, more than ever, storytellers and ta- content creators are challenged with producing more video content at a higher quality and distributing on more platforms than ever before. We're certainly aware of this here at Tested. Storyblocks makes it easy for creators to keep up with the growing demands of modern video content so you can bring all your stories to life and stop sacrificing your vision due to time, budget, or resources. Storyblocks is the world's best stock media service, offering video, audio, and images with the most affordable subscription plans and tools on the market. Their ever-growing library has over 1 million high-quality stock assets, including 4K footage, After Effects, and a Premiere Pro templates. Super easy. Great, helpful, and helpful to get started for editing and music, images, sound effects, and more. And their assets are royalty free, so you can use your content anywhere for commercial and personal use. With Storyblock's unlimited all access plan, you get unlimited downloads of everything in their library, so you can try out multiple options and find the perfect fit for whatever it is you're making. And even if your subscription ends, everything you've downloaded is yours to keep and use. Again, royalty free. That is so helpful. Music is such an important part. And just browsing through their music library, it can really change the tone and mood of your video edits. Try a bunch. Get the unlimited plan and make your video pieces really sing. Explore their library and subscribe today at storyblocks.com slash only a test. Again, that's storyblocks.com slash only a test. And now let's move on to pop culture. I had this in one. Oh, go ahead, Jeremy. All I had to do was go to the specs page. All models include Wi Fi 6. Oh, there you go. 802.11ax. You know, I bet they downplayed that because they wanted to tout 5G. Oh, yeah. That was I bet that was an deal. editorial decision. High comma speed. Yep. How about some Oxford commas in there? All right. Um, big news in. The entertainment world, Disney announced a massive reorganization. This is a very kind of bittersweet news. Of course, we had the the big, really depressing announcement that they had to really size down from uh, their parks department. They laid off about 28,000 people. Uh, recently, several people we know at Imagineering and working in various parts of the department. Um, and it's just because of COVID and the, the business not working out. And the theatrical business seems to be what might be next. Um, so uh, Bob Chapek, 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 uh, announced their CEO, New Bob. New Bob, New Bob made the announcement that they were reorganizing their entertainment divisions and restructuring to focus more on streaming. Disney Plus is the future. And he says this was their plan all along, but COVID just accelerated it. Hmm. But Disney Plus is where they're going to be devoting. And it speaks to the success maybe they've had with Disney Plus over the past um, year of launch. But... uh, this could mean fewer Disney movies in theaters 
and more money being spent on content for streaming services, which, you know, all things being equal, if you're going to MCU shows and MCU films, fine, but I, I don't want this to be a, a death knell for theaters. Well, yeah, I got mixed feelings about it. I mean, I, I like all of the excitement that comes along with a blockbuster film. I like watching the trailers and talking about it with you and going to see them in theaters. But, you know, I don't like being in theaters. And uh, I much prefer the home environment, especially, you know, with a nice surround sound system. And um, I, I, I'm just wondering if, like, how long would it take, what would it take for a company like Disney to have the same profit margins that they have in the theater from Disney plus. I just don't see it. I could see them having the same sort of, you know, ratio of like expenditure and profit, but not the numbers. Like I, I don't see them yeah. spending $200 million on a Disney plus movie. Yep. That's it. And I think that's the, the theaters allow for bigger bets for bigger payoffs. And if we're talking about more, but smaller bets for smaller, more kind of um, predictable, uh, returns, you know, uh, because it is a subscription service. I mean, numerically, it may balance out at the end or maybe be better over time with streaming just because the sheer number of people who can pay five to seven dollars a month. And what would that mean for over time raising the price of Disney Plus? That's probably in the works, right? Uh, one aspect of it felt like if you go from the theater model to Disney Plus, you can go in that direction, but you can't go in the opposite direction. A, a theatrical film can have longer legs and have a second life on a streaming service. A streaming movie, a movie made for streaming, is not going to have an opportunity to be played in the theater um, in the same way that you would with a big red carpet event, massive production, and the kind of cultural um, ties and then cultural shared experience that we had with this hundred years of film. Yeah. Um, and that's what I feel like is going to be lost. I also like the shorter form factor. You know, I, I don't have time in my life or maybe it's just patience to sit down and watch an entire 10 episode season of anything. Uh, so I like that you get a movie event that is a two and a half hour thing and you're you've committed to it you can then have the full conversation with all of your friends you don't have to con, you know commit you know an entire you know week or weekend to, to digesting the content yeah yeah it's it's really sad and it really is an accelerated thing because of covid i i don't know what this means i mean users will decide with their wallets and uh, theaters well, that's not fair <laughs> because they can't get out and spend the money right now and then theaters may not survive in order to ha give the the give the viewers the opportunity to, to spend money there like that's just really sad for for theater chains uh, i mean and Chris chris goes right next to our next story uh pixar announced that soul the film that we were all looking forward to at least i was looking forward to watching oh my god theaters Pete doctor's next film is getting a Disney Plus release streaming, no Mulan style extra premium fee. It's just going to be on Disney Plus. I mean, I'm going to say the same thing I said for for Mulan. I feel so bad for the filmmakers who spent so much time and effort in making this movie. And all the animators and all, all the folks at Pixar who want to see this on a big screen and yeah. share that theatrical experience. They certainly didn't expect for people to watch it on their phones. I mean, you could have said the same thing for Onward. I know that they got a very short theatrical period, but hardly anybody got to see it that way. Um, and I, and so I felt bad for them, and I enjoyed what, but I did enjoy watching it, you know, in my surround sound home theater. Um, but this one, this one just seems different to me because this is Pete Doctor. Like this is he's the new John Lasseter. He's running <laughs> Pixar. He's done. He did Monsters Inc. Up and Inside Out, which are like increasingly good movies this is probably they're probably expecting this to be a massive success and the, they're just not going to get the return on that investment they're never going to know how good this movie was if it can't compare to all of the box office revenues that their previous you know successes earned and I, and I feel bad for for him I feel bad for the team that worked on it just like you said um, but that said you know I plan to see it as soon as I can and, and I'll hopefully love it just as much yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I would rather they have held this for a year. Really? See, I, that that's hard because like they need that return. They need to, some kind of return on that investment. They they can't just. I mean, I suppose it is Disney, but there they are. They're laying people off. I mean, they clearly need the revenues for for some reason. 
I think it's more so that they're going to have movies on their slate for the next couple of years in theaters and it's overcrowded and they need to make room for another movie. And yeah, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a risky move. Like the peak doctor's films are high concept. And yeah. imagine if inside out was streaming only was it, it would not have the same type of cultural relevance that I think it does and has today um, being a really important movie in the animation world. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I, I definitely have mixed feelings. I mean, I wonder, will we, will they, are they now making a Pixar film for Disney plus? Do you think like that's the future? Because these were mistakes so far. We haven't seen one made from the ground up for Disney plus. And if they do that, how will it differ? Like, will it have half the budget, a quarter of the budget? Uh, and I, will I we, even, yeah, how will you even know? Because their technology improves so much. Like maybe it, you won't even be able to tell so much that, um, that you're getting a cheaper film. I think that when you say cheaper film, I think you're probably talking about time. Like the time is the, the resource about yeah. how much time you're going to give a team, how many people, how many animators you can devote uh, and just sheer number of person hours uh, on the creative side and uh, Pixar. Yes, they work on deadlines, but their story and their workflow and you've seen their successes uh, been able to be successes because they've been able to pivot and had had the time to change their story to go back and back to the drawing board, as it were. And if they're not able to do that, then it's hard to imagine a studio that big in the Disney family being able to exist as it does today uh, without theatrical releases. Have they said that this will be a Mulan style release where you pay no. a premium? No, it will not be a Mulan style release. It will, it just will be not part of Disney Plus. <sighs> yeah. I know. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> Pete Doctor needs to set up a PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> donate <laughs> donate to me. Uh, and then that last bit uh, I want to go over in pop culture is we have the plot synopsis to Ready Player Two, Jeremy. What? Did you uh, not read this? No. Oh my god. Oh my goodness. It's got a real time reaction. All right. Do, I, let, do you want to know? <laughs> let's 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 play it. Let's do this as a thought experiment. Jeremy. Is, no. Uh, well, who wants to know this? This is a stupid thing. What what were your hopes for Ready Player Two in terms of what direction I, Ernie I am Klein would go in? Signing off. We are not having this conversation. <laughs> we are having this conversation. This is the price of doing the podcast. <laughs> you oh are looking my. forward to Ready Player Two. At the end of Ready Player One, given oh where Given where the the book ended, the movie ended, where did you well, ex- what do you mean the book, story to go? Where the book, where the movie ended. That's two totally different things, right? This sure. is a sequel. The book is a sequel to the book. Okay. At least confirm that for me, right? It is a sequel to the book. Okay. Absolutely. But at the, at the end of the book, Wade Watts runs the Oasis. Everything is great. When you have a story called Ready Player Two, what do you, what, what what are your expectations? Whose story is this? You know, what do you think will will is the adventure that the core characters, the returning characters, um, would be would be going on? You know, I I have not given this any thought. What? <laughs> all, all have you have you thought about this? Like, first of all, you read this already, so this is not a fair conversation. But it's before not, you read not. this thing, were you thinking? I hope to see Wade Watts and Artemis's child, uh, you know, grow up to be an evil villain and take over the Oasis and fool his mommy and daddy. Like, were, were you thinking about these things? I, I'm not. I just want to be taken on a journey. Like, I, when I first bought the first book, I wasn't thinking anything other than I like the title. It appears to be something involving virtual reality, which, by the way, this was before Oculus was even a Kickstarter. So it was like a real crazy thing. And uh, and I and I bought it on on that alone, and I enjoyed the ride. Yeah. Um, what? So I, 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 I can be that. honest about this. I can be honest because I had thought about it before reading this. So my honest expectation for Ready Player Two as a story would be to at least in the years since the first book had come out. Yeah. To, as you said, VR is a mainstream thing. We have NBA Finals commercials for a consumer virtual reality headset. The lexicon of VR, the concepts of VR are, at least in the enthusiast and gaming communities, well understood. Uh, and the interesting kind of um, uh, 
the, the, the virtual world, the metaverse, the metaverse implications of, of communities popping up. You know, you have VR chat, you have VR streaming, you have all these things, mixed reality, you have these co concepts that certainly weren't even, you know, in, in Ernie Klein's mind when he wrote Ready Player One. So my hope would be that he has kind of studied what VR has done in, in the some way, in the same way, there was a feedback loop that VR, that his book influenced some of the very first people working at Oculus. It was required reading right. that there'd be a, a continual feedback loop that how VR has developed and evolved in the real world has influenced how he would tell do his storytelling to at least maybe not even acknowledge it, but to take those into consideration, right? How would the world, the rules of what he's established in the world of the Oasis, how can that evolve to take into things like we've seen happen in VR? Okay. Um, that was my hope, right? That's, I think that's a fair expectation as, as a science fiction is very, uh, for, for looking forward and using technology as a way to tell a story. But how would that actually manifest? Because what we saw in the book was still so far beyond anything we have today. In cultural, terms of cultural behaviors. I want, I want more of the education system because that was the coolest thing about that first book that kind of got left behind after the first third. Um, I want to see more about like actual daily, uh, you know, just like mundane life or. That, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Like, I'm not talking about like just in terms of technology, like tracking or, or, or haptic feedback. Like, of course, the world he's created has magic, essentially it's magic. I'm but I'm talking about behavior and yeah. what we've seen come out of VR behavior, whether it's in experiencing games like Rec Room or in places like VR chat or how kids use VR versus adults use VR, like all these experiments we've seen in the past five to eight years now, him taking some of those into account uh, for his creative process. Uh, like and, like maybe a required gregarious game sign in when you get your new headset. Uh, maybe, maybe some of that tracking stuff, right? I don't know. Uh, it sounds like, and I don't want to spoil it for you if you really don't want to be spoiled, but it sounds like it'll be a lot of the same. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? Do you I want mean, to know? Was Empire Strikes Back more of the same? Oh, oh no. This is not. Yes. Empire Strikes Back was not more of the same. Let me, let me, I'm just going to. What if I were to tell you that no. Ready Player Two. Wait a minute. Why do you surprises. know this? Why do you know this? Is this on the back of the book? Is this, this sanctioned this, information? This is sanctioned information. I publicly release a publisher synopsis. So this is a tease. Synopsis? This is, uh, there will be surprises. Don't worry. There will be surprises, Jimmy. All right. Oh. But the crux of the book is going to be another Easter egg hunt that Halliday had hidden in a deeper layer for Wade Watts to find. I don't, I don't want to know this. I'm upset with you right now. <laughs> this is bad. Ah. I don't want to know that. Okay. That's, that's all I'll say. All right, good. Good. It's going to be the warm and familiar. Right. You know, I hope people freaking hate it. Just leave it alone. Don't buy it. <laughs> Le and leave me alone and the fans who want to enjoy this book. Just just leave me alone. I'm going <laughs> to... Leave Wade Watts alone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, great. I, I hope that he's been in touch with Spielberg. Um, and that they're on the same page this time at the very least. So that if there's another movie, it can be the same thing as the freaking book. That'd be good. Um, and you know, I, I'm sure that I, well, I'll be personally curious to see if there's as much eighties, you know, trivia knowledge. If, if it's another holiday Easter egg, it probably is, which I happen to enjoy because I exactly crossed over in the same time period as, you know, the, the holiday character and, uh, and Ernie Klein. So yeah. great. I'll be curious to like what aspects of 80s culture he pulls on now because they've already done like done war games, Holy Grail, um, you know, D and D Rush. Um, what else? What how, and and do I overlap as much? I almost doubt it because that that first book was like spot on. So um, you it, bend perfectly. Yeah. So I wonder if, was if there's other stuff I might not as much, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. I, I can't wait. And, and I do hear Will Wheaton is doing the audio book again, which I thought was phenomenal, his first one. Speaking of 80s nostalgia, we had talked about the Netflix documentary series. Um, uh, the, what was it called? The, the video game series. Um, the one that talked about the... the uh, you mean like the, the one that was like the toys that made us? 
Yeah, yeah, but for video games, what was it called? Um, Your video game show. <laughs> did you? But my point is, did you see the uh, the Amazon Prime uh, documentary series or docu- documentary? It wasn't a series. Um, Console Wars. Ah, uh, no, but I read the book. Was it based on the book? Yeah, oh, I'm pretty oh. sure. High, high score. score. Sorry, high score. high score was Netflix. Yeah, uh, we had talked about high score. We kind of re- talked about that as comfort food as well. Kind of yeah. doing some, you know, good storytelling, revisiting a lot of the stories that we've been familiar with. Console Wars, the same thing, but interestingly, Console Wars covers a lot of the same ground as High Score and interviews some of the same people. It was really the interesting. SNES Genesis era, right? Yes, it was exactly. that, that, that was That's right what the there. book. That's what the book is about. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a really interesting comparison if you're interested in filmmaking, documentary filmmaking, to watch both of those and see how two different filmmaking teams told essentially the same story. It's basically the video game doc, video game documentary equivalent of when Armageddon and Deep Impact came out <laughs> at the same time. Hey, have you it watched any to... Song Exploder? I have not. It's really good. Is it out already? Yeah. Oh, shoot. Um, okay. There's four oh, episodes it. out, um, two of which interested me, and I watched them. Uh, and I was glad to see that the guy who does the, the, the podcast is the show host. Oh. Uh, and he does a great job. And um, the two I watched are uh, Hamilton, Wait For It, and Losing My Religion by R.E.M., which I actually liked more, like as much as I'm a Hamilton fanboy. Um, wow. So I highly recommend those. It's really well done. Good job. All right. I didn't realize that was already out. I will have to watch that tonight. Uh, all right. Um, we're just going to do one more segment, and it's going to be maybe a minute, maybe a little more than a minute, but it's going to definitely be about VR. Here we go. It's... The VR Minute. Virtual reality this week. Jeremy, have you joined joined me in <laughs> Quest Two, the era? I, you're supposed to say Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that was a thing. Is, was, is that what people are saying on Reddit now? Yep. Merry Christmas. Oh my goodness. Yep, Merry Christmas, I, I Jeremy. I, as Merry Christmas. Was falling asleep last night. I told my wife that it was Christmas Eve, oh, no. and I was very excited. Um, and, That's uh, the name of the podcast. I'm sorry, you just named this episode. I uh, yeah, it, my my quest two is charging. It's all charged now, right over there, and I, I plan to um, take my first dive into it this afternoon. All right, Merry Christmas, indeed. Mm-hmm. Um, not sold out. People can still order and get theirs. What does that say about demand? You think? Well, I don't know. It could say a lot about supply. Um, you know, I, there was a. A lot of people who had demand for the Quest, and it was selling for over retail price on eBay. So there was certainly d- demand for VR had for the Quest itself, which then hopefully everyone found out about the new one and bought that instead. And um, I, well, we will we will see. I'm sure if it was uh, if they were good numbers, Facebook would be happy to tell us at the end of the year, end of the quarter. Um, and I and I hope it's done very well for them. It's uh, you know you've you've used it. I used it for a cup for an hour or two. And it's um it's a, it's an improvement over Quest One, absolutely. Yeah, there are just wave after wave of uh, developers coming out to talk about the updates. Last week we talked about some of those. Uh, since then, I think uh, the Rec Room folks have announced some of their updates uh, for for Quest Two. Uh, Quest Two is going to get a, uh, a a a new. Rec Room Quest, or not a new one, but they're going to have the ability <laughs> to play one of the previous Rec Room Quests that was previously only on desktop. The best uh, one. The best one. Um, although... I love Lost Skulls. I, uh, but with with mid-quest saves... Oh, are they now, adding that? Oh, that's I mean, right. That's just a that's, part that's of it now. It's part it? of it now. That I, yeah. I, I feel uncompelled. If, I, if you don't have to do it all in one go, I feel like... You don't. You haven't earned it. Uh, but the bigger thing is Rec Royale, also for Quest Two only. Yeah. Well, and and Isle of Skulls also Quest Two exclusive. And I think it's important to point point out that these are the first two pieces of content that we've seen from any developer that is exclusive to Quest Two. Uh, we've seen graphics improvements, new shaders, new textures, better geometry, better lighting, better resolution. But that's always been, you know, with parity between. Uh, Quest One content, 
Um, and this is the first time that we've seen Quest 2 owners be able to do something that Quest 1 owners won't be able to do. And it's, I'm really relieved to see that, that this is a possibility for developers because one of the concerns that some devs have expressed on Twitter is that all titles have to be cross-platform. They have to be able to download on both platforms, Quest 1 and Quest 2. And I, um, I, we want to see what the Quest 2 is capable of. Let's just push that as far as it, as it can go and, and see what's possible. Um, so I'm glad to see at least, you know, there is some gray area here and developers can include content that is exclusive to Quest 2. And uh, 90 Hertz is available right now as a toggle on feature for... Uh, like for officially? Your, I know that uh, you can execute... No, no, no. Toggle on, so opt-in. Opt-in feature under experience um, features oh. uh, only for the home environment. So oh. uh, it sounds like there's still some glitchiness with the, the Guardian. Um, so they haven't, per, you know, that's not, that's why it's not a you know, system wide feature. So, uh, but so there, you can actually execute a UDB command. You can get mm -hmm. into the Android subsystem, execute a command, and it makes it 90 hertz. So you can, you know, turn it on and, and games can run in that mode if they support it. Um, it's just probably not advised. So the ADB command is also required if you want to have a virtual desktop run at 90 hertz, which is, I think, running for people. Cool. Um, so for people who have sideloaded a virtual desktop and getting streaming from their, for PCs uh, on their local Wi-Fi, uh, that is something that uh, is enabled. So good news for them. Um, I'm still waiting for the battery uh, head strap to do some testing there. Me too. Um, but I think um, now... The headsets are out there and people can share their experience on like the you know IPD adjustment, whether it's it works for them, it worked for us. Uh, and uh, it's, I think it's just great that, you know, they're out there finally. And you got Res releasing today, which is a, yes. you know, it's not a new VR game in the, you know, to the community. It came out on PSVR years ago, but yeah. it, that's a, a worthwhile download if you're into that kind of tech Tron aesthetic. It's a, it's a, it's supposedly a shooter. It's really just kind of a, chill out zone, you know, gaze game, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's a game that I think max makes a lot of the higher resolution of the quest Two because it has a lot of these grid lines and polygons that resolve well with higher resolution. Looks good. Yeah. Uh, one last bit of VR. We talked about squadrons last week. Uh, there's more details now about squadrons and a little bit of a controversy. Uh, something that wasn't uh, very apparent is that squadrons, and people noticed this when they played in VR, was that squadrons is locked to 60 frames per second uh, as it renders, as it updates. So there is a lot of reprojection going on in your headset if you're running it at 120 hertz or so. Huh. But the game only updates uh, the animations and... Uh, and rendering at 60 hertz. So that's why people have noticing some of the kind of stuttery movements of the flash frying ships. I don't know if that's something that EA plans to patch. Uh, I hope they do, um, but it has turned uh, some people off playing this game in VR. Interesting. I'm surprised at that, especially given that, you know, beyond 60 hertz is not uncommon even on the desktop experience these days. Yeah, yeah. I think they're locked. It's because it's the the cross compatibility the the uh the um the multiplayer aspect you know how how much how frequently the data is being updated the rendering for the engine on the console side being locked to 60 hertz yeah um, or capped at 60 hertz uh that seems to be why this is so it's a little unfortunate um and hopefully i said said they will uh they will patch that um and uh multiplayer for beat saber yeah when's um, that coming Soon, I think real soon. There's some people showing uh, videos now doing um, Beat Saber multiplayer. And it's basically um, typing in a, uh, a a server code. You type in a, um, a, a um, you start like a server and then you have an access code. You share it with your friend and you jump in and you'll be able to do multiplayer. What does it look like? Are people facing each other? Are they fa is they parallel? They're kind of off each other's sides. I don't know how it works relative. To can each you other, see? You can see their blocks and everything. You create an avatar, hmm. and as you as you are slicing uh, away, uh, I think you also have other people slicing away. <laughs> <laughs> okay, huh? And I assume that it's only for traditional Beat Saber levels, yeah, not three sixty. No mods. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm not three sixty or one. Oh, actually, I don't know. I don't know actually. Yeah. Okay. Huh. 
it's but weird we seeing it. just multiple. I mean, you need an avatar because you need hands, right, in the head. Um, and it's weird having you know these swinging blades that aren't yours in your in your peripheral. Yeah, I was watching some of these YouTube videos. I think it's, it's a great idea. Yeah, I don't actually don't know if you see. I don't think you see their blocks. I think you just see their swings and score. Oh, okay. Hmm. Interesting. I'll have to try it out. Um, I think that's it. It's a big day for tech. Launch of Quest. I mean, there's even Amazon Prime Day with the sales going on. Nothing too exciting for me. I'm not thinking I'm going to pick anything up. I think I can, I can resist. Uh, new phones, of course, from Apple to pre-order by the end of this week. And uh, let, let us know what you're playing if you've if you got a Quest 2 and what your experience has been. Because, yeah, I'm really curious if it meets your expectations or if we did a good job relaying our expectations to you. And uh, that does it for the podcast this week. Uh, I'll be back next week uh, where we'll cover more stuff. Uh, let's see what uh, outro we got. How about this one? Great job. User great jobs doing a wonderful job creating outros. Uh, and if you want to submit an outro, you can do it as well. You can download the file. Just search raw outro song file on Google and you'll pop into our forum. Download the, the, the source file, create a modification, upload it to SoundCloud, send me a link or post it on the forums and we'll play it in a future episode. But in the meantime, here's one from a great job. And no, I have not listened to it. Here it goes. Hi there, I didn't see you. Test it. Pop culture news. Wow, that was new. <laughs> no, you called an audible there. <laughs> Appropriate for when the sound mixing isn't done right. I should sing on every episode. <laughs> I agree. I agree. All right, enjoy watching Batman with your kids. Yeah, I can't. I can't wait. Just, just remind them it's it's he's not an aspirational figure. He's a fictional character. Oh, good. Okay, I'll do that. Yeah. Who, who yeah. is the aspirational character in the Batman universe? It's a good question. Jim Gordon. Oh, good. Okay, yeah, good one. Jim Gordon. Yeah. He's a, t- a touchstone, a, a paragon of, of valor. Very good. All right. See you next time. Bye.